thank you all. And now we'll go to our first uh, presenter, Dr. Laura Pomps. Hi, everybody. I'm glad that you are joining us to have some interest with uh, study abroad. So I've done the faculty-led study abroad. I'm hoping this will be my third year this summer with a trip to Ireland. We got scuttled right as coronavirus happened. We were practically in the air before we got the call that the programs were scuttled for the spring, which I totally understand. It was a cool opportunity, though, because we went ahead and went. My family did, and we could see the differences over in Europe to here. So the one, uh, the one course I've led for sure was one to London and Oxford, and it focuses on public health um, past, present, and future. So what has happened over there in the past, because it is the foundation place for public health. It's where we hear about the cholera outbreaks and the Broad Street pump and Jon Snow that's not in Game of Thrones, um, who helped lead and, and stop that outbreak. And it is the foundation of um, public health. So what I try to do is come up with experiences for our students that they would not necessarily get at home. So we've gone to nursing and midwifery. So out there, midwifery and having a baby at home is not unusual, and it's very unusual here. So we get some contrast there. We do hospice. We visit a hospice so that students see what end-of-life care is like. So we got beginning-of-life, end-of-life care, um, and we uh, get to see how that's handled in a place where it's handled a little bit more gracefully and a little bit uh, with a lot more thought and care and how well integrated in the healthcare system is with public health, which we may have noticed with coronavirus is not so great these days in the United States, but is improving. Um, and then we do some fun things like the British Museum, but I also do things like a scavenger hunt within the British Museum that are related to public health. Um, the picture that you see there are my students in front of Parliament. Um, so we visit parliaments, they get an idea of what the government looks like, because as we may have noticed that politics is related to health as well. And then we were lucky enough to have Oxford University uh, host us at their Nuffield School of Public Health. And I was amazed at how many people are interested in helping you develop a robust program for your students over there. And they just voluntarily would meet with us and feed us lunch and all kinds of really um, nice things. They had very famous people come in and talk to us. We also intersperse it with walking tours where we pick up the culture of where we are and then we um, learn the history as we walk. So those have been very fun. We did like a plague tour of London and, and integrated in that way. So the reason that I like this and why I would recommend a student participate in uh, study abroad is that it provides direct experience on how issues change depending on your cultural context. Like uh, I was saying with Ireland and will be a great opportunity now they took coronavirus much more seriously. They put in social distancing requirements well before we even thought about it, closed their pubs. And so cultural determines how you see a health problem. So over in London, for example, drinking is a much bigger problem than it is here, surprisingly. They have the pub culture. And so when you go to the pharmacy and get a prescription filled, they're going to give you a much stronger warning when you get Tylenol than we would give if we were giving you something with codeine. And you can actually buy something with codeine over the counter over there. So it gives them direct experience of how culture influences uh, public health. Um, it also gives them some creativity and problem solving because they see how other cultures, like in London, they use hairdressers and firefighters as part of their public health system. And that's different from what my students would think of. The other things are a little bit more within the student. It builds confidence in them. We take them on the tube. They learn to negotiate the tube. They learn to negotiate a different system. And this is just in an English speaking country where they think they know the culture. But then they learn that, you know what, they don't really know the culture and they say things a little bit differently. So we give them some background before they go and then they catch it when they get over there. But they see that even if you think you're the same, you're still different. And it helps them build confidence in meeting a situation that's different, that, it, uh, that they can do these things. I've had many students go with me that have never traveled outside the United States and some of them have never really traveled outside the state of Virginia. And so it's quite eye-opening for them to see it it broadened their horizons. Most of them went on to do other trips abroad and they've told me about it. And then the other things related to that is it really bonds students to Mason. I keep up with students who went with me on study abroad. A couple of the students in that picture there are now uh, went to our master's program and they now teach for us in our undergraduate program. So it really tightens their bond to Mason as a whole. And, and they make lifelong friendships. A couple of girls I took two years ago are uh, in each other's weddings. And they've just built those external relationships and then relationships with me and we get to see how well they do. So 
all of those things help make the students stronger, both personally and also professionally. So I would highly recommend it. And I could hardly be in global community health without recommending global health travel, right? So it kind of matches with ours. But that's basically why I would do it. I could answer all those questions, but I won't because I know I don't have time. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Laura. Um, I'm going to move on next to uh, Dr. Annika DeLucare. She's Associate Professor of Conservation Studies at the Smithsonian Mason School of Conservation. She's a biolo biological anthropologist and she specializes in ecology, behavior, and conservation of primates. So, Annika, would you like to jump on? Sure, I'd love to. Um, great, thanks for having me. Um, Yes, so my course is a mostly a field field based methods course. So it's a little bit different in that students um, travel down to Peru and they engage in a independent research project. So they develop a research project, they carry out the meth methods, they collect data, uh, they analyze the data and they present their results. Um, in you know an oral presentation at the end, so it's um, it's this uh, really kind of rigorous scientific research and data collection experience. Um, so the class is held at, like I said, it's held down in Peru at the uh, Los Amigos Biological Field Station, which is administered by the Amazon Conservation Association, or ACA. Um, uh, so the, the field site is, is a, a wonderful, you know, long-term field site, really well established, really great, fa great facilities, albeit, you know, you're in the Peruvian jungle and you're living there for a month, uh, which is a really kind of, you know, unique, obviously a unique experience for most students who have never been in a tropical uh, field location. Um, so students are developing this independent project and they get this uh, engaged hands-on opportunity to apply the disciplinary knowledge of collecting behavioral data on monkeys in the wild uh, to promote conservation solutions. So uh, that's the main focus of the project. So they're following monkeys in the wild. Um, the, the course title is called Primate Behavior Ecology and Conservation, which I forgot to mention in the very beginning. Sorry about that. Um, but so the course itself explores not only primate behavior in the wild, but we also connect it to conservation issues uh, in that area of Peru. Uh, that, so the students get to see, uh, while they're there, they get to see abandoned and uh, active illegal gold mining sites along the rivers when we travel from the main town to the field station. Uh, they're traveling by boat um, and they do an in-class activity concerning this illegal gold mining issue um, for you know, conservation implications. They also get to visit the Los Amigos Conservation Concession. Um, this concession is the world's first private conservation concession, which is an active center for, you know, research, natural resource management training, environmental education. Um, so conservation concessions uh, are set up. There are these long-term contractual partnerships between a national government like Peru and a non-governmental entity. And in this case, it would be the Amazon Conservation Association. So it gives the students this really unique opportunity to learn about conservation of large state-owned forests and watersheds that would otherwise be unmanaged. Um, so my, uh, uh, my experience teaching this course has uh, been that, you know, due to the Due to the location of it in the in the tropical forest, due to the intense work that the students do and engage in, um, it really elevates that student faculty experience. It really um, allows for mutual trust, confidence, consideration, respect. Gives the students a new sense of purpose, um, and so uh, I I stress that it it pr promotes two things: one, high impact student engagement. Right? So students get direct experience concerning social and environmental justice issues, and they also get experienced in the rigor and challenges of doing scientific research and engaging in field work. And two, it gives this really high impact student reflection. And by that, I mean it, it allows the student to, um, to, 
challenge themselves to face their fears, to experience things they've never experienced before. And that improves their own self-identity, their interpersonal maturity, cultural awareness, of course, um, their sense of flexibility. Sometimes we can't find the monkeys, you know, what are the problems in doing field work? Um, as well as, you know, their, their own emotional intelligence and moral engagement and collaboration, because we do a lot of teamwork and team-based things as well. So I would like to summarize that, you know, participation in an education abroad activity gives the students the opportunity to engage in these high impact experiential learning opportunities that address complexity of global issues. So when you bring them into the situation where they can directly experience, you know, not only understand the importance of primate field studies to the field of ecology, but be able to actually um, synthesize and um, be aware of conservation issues affecting you know, tropical forests and, and, and area and uh, issues that are pertinent uh, specific to this region of the world. Um, so that is it for me. And I, I haven't taught this course in a couple of years, but I hope to teach it again in the future. And I also hope to um, develop another course that is more explicit in looking at um, uh, the role of um, scientific field stations in promoting conservation um, in Peru. Well, thank you so much. Thank you, Annika. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, and one of the things that we're already seeing is that there's a big variety in the type of programming, um, but they all do have some, some commonalities. So this is really, all right, I'm going to move on to our next presenter. Um, oops, why does I, I keep doing that? Uh, Dr. Christy Picacaro. I always want to pronounce it incorrectly, but hopefully that's correct. Associate Professor of French in the Modern and Classical Languages Department. Uh, she's a literary scholar and cultural historian of early modern France and the French Empire. And your research is interdisciplinary, um, which includes a lot of different things I, I learned. Uh, French theater, early modern theories of language, the culture of war. Um, my brother's a, a war historian, so military historian, so I'm, I'm very interested in that myself. The history of emotions and critical race studies and multiculturalism. So Christy, can you join us, please? Thank you so much, Maria Elise. And thanks everyone for being here today. Ah, um, oh, that's my colleague, Nate. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, all good. Um, so, uh, so thank you for organizing this, and I'm so glad that we have a good crowd here of people who are considering uh, running a study abroad program. It uh, uh, was one of the most wonderful experiences of my time at Mason since I got here in 2011, and I too uh, was disappointed not to be able to go this past summer um, due to COVID-19, though that was surely the wisest uh, decision. Um, so I'm looking forward to uh, a trip this summer and to many future trips. Uh, I will say for faculty members who are on the tenure track, I was advised when I arrived at Mason to put off running a study abroad trip until after tenure. For me, that was a good decision. Um, and so I, I put it off. Uh, you can see about me um, that I uh, previously was involved in study abroad at home through the Middlebury Language Schools. Uh, they're um, probably the, the best language schools in the country. And uh, so I was a faculty member and then a director of their, at their California campus of the French school. Um, and so I've been thinking about study abroad for a long time, went on study abroad um, myself, and uh, it's true that in order to lend yourself fully to the experience um, and to bring the best of yourself and to be able to truly support your students, um, you want to consider the other the pieces of your life um, that are happening, including whether you're on the tenure track, uh, whether uh, you are going to be recovering from surgery or any types of things that um, that you would want to take into account in order to uh, sort of have all of your wits about you um, and
and be uh, uh, in your best shape in order to run a, a program abroad. My program uh, is in Paris, France. It is a one month program uh, that we ran last year during the month of June. Um, it's uh, in Paris because Paris is Paris. Um, and so uh, it's a language focused program. So the students spend uh, every morning in an international school. Uh, they test into a certain level for the language. And so what's wonderful about that is that they are exposed uh, to students around the world in this international school. So they take intensive language classes there and develop wonderful friendships. They live with host families, which is also an incredible way to really learn your everyday French that you don't always get in the classroom. Like, is the salt in that cabinet or the other one? Um, these are things that when I studied abroad uh, in Italy as an undergrad, I realized I had no knowledge of the mundanities of everyday life, that type of vocabulary. I could talk about high level literary subjects, but I couldn't ask in what cabinet I would find another roll of toilet paper. And so, uh, so having a host family situation is really great. Um, although for us as academic directors, we also have to be ready to be involved and to help if your students um, are not comfortable making certain communications as they get to know their host families or simply their language level is not uh, high enough. Um, being ready to make a quick phone call uh, uh, makes a huge difference for the students and for the host families. Um, so in my program, uh, the students are in class uh, in the international school in the mornings and then three times a week and on some weekends we do co-curricular excursions all around the Paris region and outside of it. Uh, this picture of me is when we visited Giverny um, with the students. So we packed into a bus and went there and it was absolutely a stunning experience for students uh, to sort of be existing in it as if they were in an impressionist painting. So they, that opened uh, so many, uh, so many of the eyes of my students, and they and uh, they they hit the gift shop much harder than I would have imagined, uh, bringing home lots of souvenirs for themselves and their families. Um, and you know what I wanted to address especially with you all uh, for current directors and also for future directors, in addition to just encouraging you to do this. It is so wonderful for us uh, as faculty members and, and an incredible experience for our students. So the first, most important thing is that high recommendation of giving it a try. Our global education office really does everything that they can to support us and to support the students. Uh, so I just want to give a shout out to the ability to have really sort of direct conversations about what needs you think your students will have, what needs you will have. Um, and uh, I found uh, Global Education to be very responsive to that. So um, I want to share that endorsement as well. Um, so I wanted to say a few things about diversity today very quickly, um, because uh, as you see here, I'm the Director of Faculty Diversity in the College of, uh, of Humanities and Social Sciences. Before that, I was the college coordinator for diversity and global education. And so I was really thinking about what diversity and global education together could mean. And uh, I'm currently serving on our uh, university's anti-racism and inclusive excellence task force. So I see study abroad as a very important component of what we want to give to our students, who we want our students to be as they move out into the world, uh, into a, a very global world indeed, indeed and to a multicultural society that is now very much in conflict. So the types of sort of intercultural competencies and, and linguistic competencies that they gain on these study abroad trips is, is absolutely stunning. And I really think it's so important that we create a variety of options for them to go. When we do go, what we need to realize, and these are my points that you can see on the slide, is that systemic racism and discrimination are everywhere in the world. It's not just the United States. It's everywhere, literally. And so we need to be aware of the histories and of the dangers that this can pose to our students while they are abroad. We need to communicate openly with them about this um, and be ready to support them in every way necessary. That is emotionally, but also if you're interfacing with law enforcement, um, since for example, the policing of black bodies um, 
has some of the same problems of racial profiling that we have in this country and some of the same dangers. And so um, this is something that I uh, speak about very openly with my students. I myself have been racialized in different ways uh, in different places and also depending how I wear my hair. Um, and so being aware of this, uh, this is very real. Um, and so, you know, if I wear my hair one way, I'm racialized as a Muslim woman uh, in uh, France. And if I wear my hair the way I am today, then I'm racialized as someone who is uh, is descended from sub-Saharan African regions. That makes a big difference for how people look at me and treat me, and I am in charge of all of these students. So we have to bring that level of self-awareness, um, and then we have to bring in a level of, of aware awareness about our students. There are some countries where uh, being uh, openly uh, homosexual or perceived as such could actually be lethally dangerous for a student. Um, so what can we do to protect that student um, allowing them to be themselves and to have exactly the same experience as anyone else in the sense of being able to uh, learn that uh, those intercultural lessons and and gain the academic skills that we're also uh, hoping to impart during these trips. So I really encourage everyone who's already doing this and who's thinking about doing this to be uh, informed about these dynamics. Um, I also think that our courses and co-curricular programming should shed light on histories of colonization, slavery, and oppression, as well as the positive side of that coin, resistance, social justice, multiculturalism, and the contributions of minoritized groups. Imagine students studying abroad in the United States coming to Washington, D.C. and not talking about the history of slavery, not talking about uh, the policing of Black bodies here, and not talking about or celebrating the incredible contributions of the Black community in this country uh, from so many perspectives. You're getting a completely incorrect portrait of what the United States is. So even if they're going to, the, to work with, at the NIH or something that is more scientific, we don't want them to exist in that bubble. The bubble is not useful to them. We are depriving them of realities. So I think we want to be very plugged in, no matter what our discipline, to how we can enhance their knowledge and connectedness to the realities of these histories in all of their facets. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention that studies uh, show, and I've looked at a lot of research on study abroad, um, that students really transform while they are abroad. And they start to express themselves in new ways because they're outside of their home context. I've done some specific work on LGBTQ plus students in this regard that it's hard for many students to come out of the closet um, for many reasons, but they may find themselves in a country, in a city like London, in a city like Paris, or many others uh, across the world, where they suddenly feel that they can find a community and feel open. What can we do to encourage this? Um, it's not only through the types of co-curricular programming that we offer in Paris. We, uh, we do a walk through the Marais, which is the gay district and also one of the oldest districts in France. We talk about the Renaissance and we talk about gay culture. Um, and I mentioned this in my advertisements for the class. Uh, we also do a Black Paris walk. And so I tell students, you're not gonna learn uh, you're not going to have a baguette and beret version of Paris in this trip. You will see, you will eat baguettes. You will not see many berets, that's a stereotype. But you're also going to see the diversity of this city and the richness of that. And you will be a part of that when you're there. And you see this picture of uh, my students. Um, we are on a cruise on the Seine. And in the background, you see uh, Notre Dame that's been burnt out. This was the year uh, just a few months after that tragic fire. And so... I had a very diverse group. I had people who re were retired. I had people who were finishing their first year. So um, how can we include them in how we do our programming? How can we foster their personal growth while they're there? Um, and so uh, those are my remarks. Uh, you can find me at this email address. Please feel free to reach out. I'm interested in supporting current directors, future directors, and answering your questions, and just can't recommend this experience highly enough. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Christy. And I will probably be reaching out to you about um, perhaps doing some follow up um, conversations with faculty and, and how we can work on helping them. So thank That's you great. For, for, for attending today. Okay, our next presenters are 
uh, Gebre, Tessa for Michael, and Carol Pinu, um, and they are leading a course um, of Africa Zooms Ahead, Pan African course. It's virtual, our virtual study abroad. Um, uh, Dr. Gebre was as the former uh, finance minister of Eritrea, and Carol is a journalist who has reported for CNN, BBC, NPR, VOA, and Radio France Internationale. So, uh, take it away. Well, thank you so much. And I've loved hearing all of these. I want to take everybody's trip. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, the, the course really came about when all the courses were canceled. I was actually uh, s scheduled to lead another course on Eritrea that was in person. And when everything was canceled, we started looking at making the Eritrea one virtual. And then we realized, you know, you could actually do the whole continent, which you could never do in person. You could never have this course if it were in person because you can't do a continent three times the size of the US in two weeks in 54 plus you know, countries. So it really opened up an idea of doing this and being able to introduce students to a different Africa and to African institutions. So I, I think Gebre, um, Gebre is the, the expert on, <laughs> on the content. <laughs> so with the reason for the course. <laughs> well, she humors me that way, but uh, really. <laughs> well, anyway, this is really an opportunity that has been created by this event to really look at a continent that has been so misunderstood. So, you know, put into a caricature that it has become the other, you know, separate from the ex human experience, you know, the universal human experience. When somebody talks about Africa, they talk about it in a different way. It's not part and parcel of the whole human existence, human development. And when you look at it, Africa has been always considered as a tabula rasa, without any history, without any past, without any institutions of its own, without any indigenous values, a little bit different, but also part of the universal values. So what is this course provides is an opportunity to really, in a small way, destroy that caricature about Africa, give an opportunity to people, you know, in this particularly in this highly charged environment, in this uh, situation where we have a global reflection about, you know, uh, the whole world, what's going on around us, to give you know, uh, an insight into what's really happening. What is Africa? How is, you know, what do we think about Africa and what do Africans think about themselves in this instance? This is really a great opportunity for students, particularly who are coming into this, as the previous speaker was saying, globalized world, to have a really a much more accurate perception and understanding of Africans, of 1.2 billion of them, and to, uh, you know, to really have a look at, at that from, some of the person, personalities that are uh, in charge with leading the destiny of Africa now at this particular moment. So, so what we'll do, we have um, sessions during the day. It's mostly over MLK weekend and then one Saturday a month after that. And each of the days has two sessions. At each session, we have a guest speaker who is, uh, in each case, a trailblazer, uh, usually at one of the major African-owned institutions. So we have people like the chief economist for Africsim uh, Bank, the ex Import-Export Bank of Africa. And with the Continental Free Trade Agreement, making Africa one of the largest trading blocks in the world, he's the one who's implementing it. So it's, it's the biggest thing happening in Africa, and he's the man. We have the CEO of the new Africa CDC that is now leading the charge on COVID. Um, we have a man who is the expert. He had done a study, the first ever study on African youth, what they want, what their dreams are. Africa has the largest youth bulge in the world, and finding out who they are is really important. And after that session, we then have a cultural exchange where we bring together young African professionals, entrepreneurs, tech gurus, um, people who are activists, so that students can then meet their counterparts. It's virtual, it's disappointing it's virtual, of course, but on the other hand, it's cool that it's virtual because we can go all over. We can bring in somebody from South Africa and somebody from Ghana and somebody from Egypt and all of them together in a chat room all together. So I think that brings out, um, there's a disadvantage of virtual and, and the advantage. 
Uh, the other part that I think is really an important part of this is addressing the gap between how Africans see themselves versus how Western media sees them. And so having an opportunity to really address those, uh, those stereotypes. Yeah. yeah. No, I remember when I, I, I came here for the first time as an exchange student when I was a real teenager, and the questions that I would ask them, you know, uh, to mention a specific incident about, you know, the jungle in Africa. I came from Eritrea. There are no real jungles. It's a dry <laughs> area. And I was in Minnesota. And they were asking me about jungles. I said, this is the first time I have ever seen a jungle. You know, but looking back now, engaging with uh, young African students here in the United States, you find out that they are being asked the same questions. You know, they are talking about, you know, about the relationship with whether they have a monkey for a pet or a lion to ride or whatever. You know, this kind of uh, insane kind of, uh, you know, misconceptions. So what this provides is an opportunity really to engage the continent that has about three trillion you know, uh, dollars of GDP, 54 countries, becoming a very dynamic, you know, showing one of the fastest growing areas in the globe, and which is becoming most uh, in terms of economic, social, econ and political uh, relations of strategic importance to the United States. So it really is an opportunity for students who are preparing themselves on a much broader scale in you know, the viewpoint, to have an opportunity to engage with this uh, continent. And part of what we'll do for addressing the gap is looking at uh, videos, multimedia, commercials, clips from films, things that show both you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so really bad stereotypes, and then how Africans show themselves in it, and looking at those and having students able to compare and contrast. And then aside from that, we also want to open this up to a wider conversation at Mason. So we've been working with Mason Life uh, to do a video for their Instagram account of African students who are taking the class, who are holding up a photo saying, this is the image of my Africa. This is how I see Africa. And hoping that that'll spark a conversation. So you actually see uh, the photo there. You know, we've never done this trip before. It's a virtual trip. So we didn't know what to show other than a computer and Zoom, which we're all bored with now. But <laughs> this is actually from the banner of social media that one of the students created so that we can have this conversation both within the class and going beyond the class to have the conversation in a wider uh, way with Mason and hopefully start, start these conversations about how people see Africa. Um, I did wanna say, cause people are talking about, you know, how much uh, study abroad means and, you know, how it changes students. I led a trip last year to Eritrea and I definitely saw, you know, students talked about how this was so transformative. And of course you think, you know, oh, my trip was, you know, but I don't doubt that every trip is. Um, but the other part that I just wanted to add, um, that because I do, you know, Eritrea is a country that I was a reporter in, that uh, Gabriel Sadesse is from, and it's a country that has a lot of uh, a lot of very negative press and is often really misunderstood. That gap in narrative is probably widest in Eritrea. For the the Eritreans who we met, it was equally transformative for them. It meant so much to them that U.S. university students came with an open mind and just listened, and they didn't judge. They didn't come and say, oh, you're wonderful, but they also didn't come saying, we read, you're awful. They, we asked every single thing. They answered everything, but I cannot tell you how many times from top ministers down, people would say, it means so much to me that you came. And so I think that there really is something of, you know, certainly it's transformative for the students, but in a way, those students are also ambassadors. And in ways that no diplomat could ever make them feel. They, you know, these students really made the Eritreans feel special. And Marie Alice, I know you saw that because they even had a reception for us afterwards at the community center. And uh, it, it just really meant a lot. So I think that it's an important thing for the student individually, but it's also really important for the world. Uh, um, so I don't know if there was anything else. <laughs> 
<laughs> I think the importance here is uh, it's very transformative in terms of uh, engage, in sharing the experience with people on the ground. And the importance is that coming to the understanding that they are really people with the same kind of aspirations, mm -hmm. the same kind of expectations, and they are not different, that we're all people. We are diverse in our external mm -hmm. manifestations or presentations, but we really at heart, we are all the same. And that is a very, very important, a very simple, but very important message that the people will get from, uh, from this thing. Yeah, and I, and I just yes. really want to say, that I really appreciate that George Mason, um, that Geo, that Shar, and George Mason is willing to put out a very different image of Africa and, and a radically different idea of how development happens. And so thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Um, and actually that the, those last points uh, were very, are very interesting, very informative. And um, there is a lot of conversation in, within the study abroad community or the education abroad community about also the effect of having study abroad in locations, uh, much the same as you know the the questions around research as well, right? Like, what is the impact of the people doing the research on the research participants? It's the same type of thing. What are what are we exporting, and how are we uh, working with the local populations? So that's something that el something else that maybe in the future we can also have a session like this to address, because um, Annika also mentioned a bit a bit about it in her conversation too. So. All right, so moving on, we uh, next have Dr. Nathaniel Greenberg. He's Associate Professor and um, Arabic Program Coordinator here in the Modern and Classical Languages Department. Uh, and he's com a comparatist by training with interest in contemporary cultural productions, politics, and theory. All right, Nathaniel. Okay, hi, hi Maria Alice, hi everybody. Um, that was so interesting to hear from Dr. Gebre and and Carol about the Eritrea program. And uh, please do be in touch. I'm sure students that are doing Arabic would also be interested and in maybe we can do some kind of uh, coordinate with sort of a North Africa, although borders are difficult, I know. Um, anyway, so I, this is really interesting to hear about everybody's trips and uh, it's getting me, you know, it's definitely lighting the fire to go back. Um, I've done uh, four study ab abroad trips, uh, twice in Morocco, twice in Jordan, um, our, the function of our trips are, is really language immersion. Um, they're geared towards students that are minoring or majoring in Arabic. And it's kind of your classic, um, you know, language immersion, <clears throat> full exposure to the city, the country. They do some weekend um, excursions and things like that. We have host institutions. Um, a big part of it for, for us is, is trying to really vet and get uh, good qualified uh, instructors and providers so that can help sort of deliver that full immersion experience. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think, I think we're probably preaching to the choir here. And so I, but I mean, every, <laughs> it's, we, the, uh, I think everything that's been said is true. I mean, I put down a very sort of uh, simplistic three points and a, a open eyes, open ears, open heart. And it sounds a little bit like open heart surgery, which I, that's not, that's not the idea, but I went with open heart instead of open mind. So um, anyhow, but yeah, this is the idea, you know, I think it, it really, it's about, um, you know, taking students out of their comfort zone and seeing reality as it is, uh, you know, versus the myths that circulate in media. And I think this definitely just complements Dr. Jibre's point um, in terms of, you know, we, uh, particularly in the, with regards to the Arab world, I mean, it's not just the sort of terrorism narratives that float around. It's also these ideas that it's, you know, that there's underdevelopment, that there's despotism, that, you know, that, that people sort of, uh, that there's hyper religiosity, you know, and these, and you get there and you realize, you know, students realize very quickly that life is just like, life goes on just like in any other, any other society, any other situation. Um, with unique points that make it different and um, and exciting. And, you know, Amman right now, the capital of Jordan, I tell people, I think is like the cultural capital of the Arab world right now because of what's been going on with uh, Damascus and Cairo. And um, uh, last time I was there, I went to like an international theater festival that was incredible. Um, so we did, you know, very like, very like, classic, beautiful sort of 
opera, you know, opera house with red carpet and, you know, big name actors from around the Arab world performing theater. I mean, we saw a play put on by um, a, a production of the famous Spaniard uh, Lorca, a, a production of Lorca, you know, in Jordan by this great troupe of actors. Um, I always love to go to like the bookstores. Uh, I tell students, you know, the Arab world is still very much a print culture, I think, that people read newspapers, uh, sit down at the coffee shop, read a newspaper, you know, maybe smoke a hookah, watch the news or something like that. And so I love to uh, take students to go get the newspapers, to go get the books, go to the book stands. Uh, you know, you got all the books laid out on the sidewalk and it's, you know, it's fascinating because it's, these things don't, this is not on Amazon, this kind of stuff. You don't, you know, local, local publications, local, you know, definitely newspapers. That's the kind of thing that you can only get on the ground. And I guess to, on the theater, on the theater metaphor here, I like to tell students, I love going and reading the newspapers because it's like you're stepping into the third act of a play that's been going on for a long time. And you don't know exactly who the characters are. You don't know what the but you, you're there and you, and you start to absorb it and you open eyes and you realize that there's this whole sort of, there are all these lives and narratives and politics and dramas going on um, that we just don't get access to in the United States. Um, and then making connections, you know, students, I tell them you will make lifelong connections. Our Jordan program is eight weeks. Uh, we've got a lot of love intrigue that goes on with locals, which can be challenging for the faculty director. I have to say, um, but you know, these pretty American girls and American guys walking around and they meet people, you know, and they've got, they make friends, um, you know, students um, get to get, cause we have, uh, we do speaking tutors, one-on-one -on -one, uh, speaking tutors. So we get like local college students involved and stuff like that. And, you know, they go out, they go have hookahs, they play soccer um, and, and it's, they develop actually, you know, real friendships, I think. Um, and then also somebody made the point about just sort of reinforcing. It does also build a sense of com camaraderie among students. It sort of helps realize, I think, what Benedict Anderson talked about as one of the principal goals of the university in general, which is to bring pe people together from dis disparate backgrounds and to put them into a common campus and give them an experience. Well, study abroad really maximizes that for students involved. They really bond together. And that's cool. That goes that goes anywhere, obviously, um, where study abroad goes. So, all right, that's my spiel, Marie Alice. I'll stick around. This is really interesting. Thank you. Oh, good, good. Yeah, nice, yeah. nice job. Um, I also love the part about you being schooled by your seven-year-old on your slide. Yeah, um, I put that together quickly, but again, I just got to keep it real. Just trying to keep it real here. You know. Yeah, no, I know. I, 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 my 16 year old, I can't help him with any of his homework right now. It's, it's very embarrassing because I think I'm intelligent, but I, I it's way beyond. I know it's completely it's way beyond these days. everything. I know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. I just have to learn my little pony and I'm set right now. Oh, yeah. Pokemon. I had it all up there. All right. Our next picture is Dr. Carolee Dawn. Um, okay, and she's an assistant professor in, oh, I can't get the slides to function. All right, hey, okay. Um, she's a professor in the arts management program. Um, in addition to being the uh, academic director of the arts management international study abroad courses, she is a non-traditional student mentor in the arts management program. So Carolee, you wanna take it away? I have to say, this is so hard for me to do five to seven minutes because I could talk for hours about this. Um, this was a dream of mine when I first came to the arts management program and we talked about it for several years and I was finally able to launch our first program in 2013. So I've been lucky enough to do this for uh, going on, you know, this would have been our seventh year this summer. Uh, we were going to have this amazing program planned for Ireland, but of course uh, it's been postponed now. But my program it does a little bit different. We have an arts, what we have is an arts, international arts management. Then different countries we focus you know usually we do at least two different countries or two different regions each year so we've been to belgium and france and ireland and the netherlands and the united kingdom we've done scotland england and northern ireland wales is in the future um, and we really focus on you know current models of arts management in these countries but then we also really focus on the traditional arts and cultural heritage and cultural relations as well and it's a full-on immersive program. And thanks to the help with global education offices, um, 
we've been able to just continuously develop this course each year to, to where we actually have partnerships now we're in discussion with because um, they want us to come back. They want us to come back and keep doing some of these programs that we're doing with them. And it has just been this amazing opportunity for us. And it's grads, undergrads, and we have a high international student population as well. It's always active, immersive. They're on their feet. I warn them. They get an email every week, say, wear comfortable shoes. We will be walking. You know, it's like travel light because we're moving around a lot as well. Um, and we do, you know, we do service learning opportunities. There's all kinds of interactive projects we do. Because um, it's really based about meeting different artists, artists, their arts organizations. We, um, you know, and the other thing I would say too is don't be shy to ask to, for interviews. Don't be shy. I, I am always amazed when I contact someone cold where I don't have a relationship and say, hey, I'm bringing some of my best students over for the summer. Would you be interested in, in meeting with us? Because I'd love to talk with you about this topic. And everyone is more than welcome you know, welcoming. We've had amazing opportunities. We've talked with UNESCO. We've talked with the EU Capitals of Culture policy experts. We've talked with the folklorist of Ireland. We've talked with executive directors of every major arts organization in any of these countries. But then also, we, I try to do a mix as well. So we're talking, of course, with like the, the standard bearers of the arts organizations in each country. But then I also make sure we're going into the rural areas as well and looking at community arts and looking at uh, some of the, the challenges they face as well, some of their collaborations, or working with the Gaeltacht in Ireland where they use the traditional arts as a way to make sure that, that the Gaelic language is, is, is continuing. So there's just all kinds of opportunities for this kind of collaboration. And one thing I would stress if you're thinking of planning a program is don't over plan your program. Don't over plan, leave time for happy accidents. Because we have had amazing opportunities where we'll be in a meeting, we'll go on a tour of their organization, and then perhaps we get to go and, and sit on, on their rehearsal, or we get to sit in on a class if we're meeting with, at another university. Um, we struck up a conversation with a policeman in London, and the next thing I knew, he was escorting us in to watch the rehearsal of the Trooping of the Colors, which is a big event in the UK and impossible to get tickets to. And here we got really great seats to watch the rehearsal. The queen was not there, but we did see her the next day when she was going down the street in her, her, her cavalcade. But I really do stress that is don't over plan, allow for, for a little bit of flexibility because you never know what you might be able to, uh, to, to stumble upon or get invited to. Um, but as many, many people have seen, I think this is such an amazing opportunity for students. And I can give you so many stories about students over the last seven years where they've just, you know, they've really just blossomed, you know, and a, a couple of people mentioned that term, you know, finding themselves, but it, it's true. This really happens. Um, you see students who have maybe been quiet in the classroom, all of a sudden take on leadership roles with the group or, re, you know, I had a student that hardly ever talked in my class. And by the time we left Ireland, she was almost fluent in Gaelic and had made friends everywhere. I mean, I'll never forget that. Um, and the way that they can interact with people as well, they're building their, their professional and, and personal relationships. And we have seen amazing success in our program where the work we do there has led to research that they've do, done in our classes now uh, back here in the States and even to capstone studies. And this has been so successful for us actually, and Marie Alice, I need to talk to you about this in a little bit more detail at another time, is my dream in all of this was I wanted to start an international arts management track in our program. And because of the, the uh, experiences we've had with our yearly you know, annual study abroad program, we're looking at doing this now and doing a certificate in international arts management of which the study abroad would be an essential part of it. So I can't thank uh, the Global Ed Office and the, and their, the people there enough for everything you've, you've helped me to do. And it's one of those things too, where I really appreciate your office where, you know, we were doing Scotland and we were doing Ireland a couple years ago. And, you know, with traveling, traveling by air is always just a stressful, stressful situation when you're trying to get 16 to 20 students from one location to another via airports. And I asked, it's like, could we take the ferry from Scotland to Ireland? 
And we did. And we had the most amazing, amazing opportunity because we, we actually, it just worked out that we kind of had the ferry all, all to ourselves. And we had this amazing opportunity to kind of just talk about everything that had happened in Scotland. And then I got to hear, you know, what they wanted to do in Ireland, you know, what, you know, and kind of have that cultural talk with them. It's like, you know, we, we, we did that before in our orientation, but now that they have the Scottish experience, it's like, okay, now we can't wait to go to Ireland and see how this compares, how this is different. And it was just this unbelievable opportunity. And it took a lot of extra planning and Laura Scobie, I will always be very thankful for her to get us on a, a train, to a bus, to a boat, to another bus, to another bus, to Galway. But the, the travel experience, although it was a full day of travel, really allowed a bonding with our class that was really unbelievable. And we, we still are all in conversation. And that's the other thing as well, is this has led to us, we have uh, a study abroad alumni group and we get together and talk about once a month about current issues that are happening. We're sharing articles all the time. I go to them when I plan my next trip um, to get, you know, what did you love about this? What, what did we not do that you wished we would have done? You know, so they've kind of become a partner. This alumni group has become a partner with me as I plan the next classes. And, and like I said, I, it, it's just amazing. And the other thing I would say too, just once again is, don't be shy. If you're wanting interaction, just contact people. It is really amazing. If you say that you're a student group and you want to meet with you because of this, I have yet to be told no. I may not get the exact person I was hoping for, but I'm getting there in the office. I'm getting in their organization. And we actually have had some experiences here where students are now looking at doing internships with some of these organizations that we've met with. And it looks like one of my students will be able to do an internship next summer uh, on cultural policy in Belfast with, uh, with a, a couple of leading experts there that we had, we had met with. So I, once again, I can't, can't say enough. And, and I'm going to stop here because I could go on forever. But, uh, you know, and, and I'm always open if someone wants to reach out to me. It sounds like my program might be a little bit different from some of the other ones. But uh, I'm always happy to help because I really think this is such an essential part of a student's journey. So thank you, Global Ed, for, for being, the, being the, the beacons in the night when you're trying to put these classes together. Well, you are very, very welcome. Um, it's our pleasure. Um, it's, yeah, it's what we do, right? Um, I think there are a lot of people, although all the programs seem, are very different, right? And they have different structures, different departments, different uh, goals. Um, there are a lot of things that I think that we can take from each other. Um, I, you know, that bit about the alumni is very interesting. And um, so I think that's something that others might be interested in as well. All right, let's move on to the next, the next presenter is Dr. Jennifer Lewis. Uh, she's in environmental science and policy. And she started to bring students to Nepal through our office while she was still a doctoral student. So we've been working with her for quite a bit. She is a filmmaker, has produced several documentaries, and her passion is using film for good and to communicate why we need to be doing all these good things. So Jennifer, oh wait, uh, <laughs> all right, there we go. Yeah. Jennifer, here's your slide, thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, obviously, I didn't follow the directions. <laughs> oh, you did fine, it's wonderful. <laughs> so I apologize about my slide, but, um, I also just wanted to quickly say, uh, uh, I have never met Carolee, but my goodness, your enthusiasm is amazing. And um, I think I love the very last line, it's fun. And that's one of the, the most important things. I think it's getting faculty that are like you, that are, that are passionate and love doing this and, and wanna see what else they can build from it. And I've been the same way and I just wanna talk to you guys briefly about kind of what my game is. Um, so I teach uh, conservation storytelling uh, in Nepal, and uh, I've been doing it, this is, this would have been my, this is going to be, I guess, my fourth year. I'm going to do it online this year, um, and like uh, the group that's teaching about uh, the continent of Africa, I actually also found some ways that I could change the game a little bit in ways that we never would have been able to do otherwise, and I'm, I'm really excited about that, and I'll talk maybe if I have time. Uh, really quickly about that. But the whole purpose of what I do is um, I'm really interested in teaching students how to communicate better. Um, we focus on conservation stories, but uh, the students in the class don't have to know anything about science or conservation. It's just the type of stories that we happen to be covering. 
uh, and I usually get students that are in environmental science, biology, natural sciences, but I also get uh, communication students, film and video students, and, and everywhere else. Um, uh, the reason um, that I picked Nepal um, was purposeful, and, and that's kind of the, the game of what I wanted to talk about today, which is the importance of using these classes to emphasize uh, the differences and the similarities uh, across the planet and to giving students the chance to understand their place in this world um, and to have empathy for people outside of who they normally interact with. And I think to me that is one of the most important things that Global Ed does. Um, and I actually believe that these classes may be more important than anything else they take while they're in the university um, because it's shaping who they're gonna become. To me, that age group between say 18 to 22 is where you really figure out who you're gonna be as a human being. Um, and, uh, and that travel more than anything else can open your eyes um, to understanding and having empathy for others. Uh, so when I picked the place that I picked, I did it because first of all, it was a great place as far as cinematography was concerned, but there are lots of great places. Um, but I picked it because I wanted them to see something that wasn't like what they were used to. Um, and I wanted them to meet people that were similar to them, but very different from them. Uh, and, uh, and I work very hard to incorporate that into the rest of the learning experiences that they're, uh, they're getting. And actually I tell them all um, when they first come into the classroom that if they only learn that, that life lesson, then I feel like they got an A. That that's really what my game is. Even though obviously I have a, a class that I'm teaching, um, more than anything else, I want them to be able to come away with that. And, um, and so I, I incorporated in lots of different ways and I just wanted to give you those bits of information because I wanted you to be able to think, how could I actually do that in my class also? Um, uh, so one of the ways that I do it is, uh, is kind of obvious, and I think a lot of other people are doing this too, is that you get them to interact with the locals. Um, we work with students that are very much like themselves. We work with uh, people that are on our crew um, that are from Nepal. We, uh, we, we interview and, uh, and hang out with. They get lots of opportunities to just go and hang out with people um, and explore on their own. Um, but we also try and make sure that they're aware of the disparity that exists between say the West and, 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 and a lot of the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world. Uh, and, uh, and we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, just one example is uh, I, one of the places that I take them for just a couple of nights is way up in the Himalayas. And it's a place that had uh, been impacted from the 2015 earthquakes. Uh, where lots of people, many people were killed, um, many people lost their homes, um, and there are, there's a place that we stay where there are some little girls that are orphans from that. Um, the place that we stay, the bedrooms are actually below freezing at night, and there's no heat, and, uh, but it's only two days, and so this is just one example of one way that I try and show them, you, you only have to deal with this for two days, the rest of the world is dealing with this all the time. And there's lots of different things that I think you could build in. The place we picked was because it's a phenomenal landscape. It's the Himalayas. It is the fourth largest peak that we're sleeping under when we get to that spot. But there's a lot of other things that you can incorporate to make sure that they're getting lessons besides just the topic um, of the class. Um, uh, we also get them to do things as a part of the class. They take everything they learn and they do something with it where they're actually giving back to the people in the country. So for example, one year we made a film about uh, a PR film for a, a local NGO that was doing environmental work and also um, some social justice type work. Um, these are types of things that they can get uh, involved in directly. And I also just kind of wanted to mention that um, uh, we actually think that this is so interesting, this, this, this microcosm that's happening as a result of these study abroad classes. Some of you mentioned that uh, people are uh, being affected in those countries also, and that you're kind of examining how that's happening and what more can you do to kind of incorporate that. And, uh, and this year, what we're doing is we're actually involving the students. Uh, it's going to be a group of students from our university 
And they're also going to have a cohort of students from the universities in Nepal that are going to be a part of the class so that they can all interact and all work together um, on the projects and then eventually their, their big film um, that they're going to make, which is going to be this year on uh, the impacts of climate change uh, to Nepal. And, um, and we think it's so interesting to us, the dynamics of what happens in these situations that we're actually going to try and document it um, as a film and follow these students, this particular cohort for say like the next 10 years, catch up with them and find out how much of an impact did this have on you? And um, are they still interacting? Are the students in the class that are from, G you know, from Global Ed still interacting? And are they interacting with the Nepalese students? Um, so there's lots and lots and lots of things that you could be, you could be doing in addition to um, the classes themselves. And I think that's one of the, uh, the most important things out of Global Ed that's possible with this. And I, I love being a part of it. And I really appreciate you guys letting me talk a little bit about it also. Um, I don't want to go over because I think we're maybe a little bit beyond, but, um, but thank you for letting me participate in this. Well, thank you. Thank you. Um, that's wonderful. And yeah, I'm looking forward to that study. That's, that's going to be really interesting to see as the years go along. Um, yes, um, I, I have realized that people who are involved in education abroad tend to be uh, storytellers in general. So I'm not surprised that we're a little over our time. Um, so our next, our next speakers are Dr. Audra Parker and Dr. Christian Zenkoff, and they are from the College of Education and Human Development. Audra is the Academic Program Coordinator in Elementary Education and is, in, and is Professor in Charge of the Teaching and Teacher Education Specialization in the PhD program. And Christian is the Academic, academic Program Coordinator in Secondary Education. Uh, both lead a cohort groups to Cambridge where they work with local primary and secondary schools. Did I get that right? Yes. So, okay. <laughs> yes. I can't get the slides. I can't move the slides. Right, there we go. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. It's been exciting to hear everyone's work, and it, it definitely um, reminds me of how much I enjoy study abroad and why we we collaborate with the Global Education Office to lead this trip. And it also makes me really sad that we didn't have our Cambridge trip in October, September, October of this year. Um, hopeful for April. I don't know if that's going to go or not. I have no, I have a feeling probably not, but we'll see. Um, anyway, I'm sure we're all kind of glad, hoping to get back to some semblance of normal soon. So Christian, I think we're going to tag team on this. We're normally in the same house um, because we're married, but I'm actually in, in Roanoke right now and he's in, in Alexandria. So we're tag teaming not from upstairs and downstairs, but from actually a couple hours distance. So <laughs> Christian, feel free to, to hop in whenever. Um, but I'll start us off. We, we've been doing this um, trip in Cambridge. Um, I take a group of elementary ed uh, teacher candidates um, from our, our graduate program. We just opened undergrad, so we're, we'll be exploring study abroad options for them soon, I'm sure. Um, but this one's currently for our master's students who are seeking teaching licensure in elementary ed, and we travel for four weeks to Cambridge. And it is a field-based experience. They are uh, in their internship in the U.S for a couple of weeks to start the school year. And then we pick up and we go to Cambridge for four weeks and they continue daily in a primary school. Uh, we have three partner schools there. Um, we, they continue in one of those primary schools paired with one teacher and they get to know one class of, uh, of students in Cambridge for those four weeks. Um, and it's, an, it's an incredible experience. And then they return back to their internship for the rest of the school year um, here in the US. Christian, I don't know if you want to describe the secondary experience because it's slightly different. Sure. It's uh, our experience is just two weeks instead of four, and uh, it's very similar in the sense that as teacher candidates again, uh, generally pre-internship, so they, they haven't earned a license yet. Um, our folks generally do sort of a tour of mentors working with a range of teachers across the couple of weeks, rather than really dedicating their time to work with one mentor teacher. Ours is, uh, I think our our program, because it's only two weeks as opposed to four with elementary education, is uh, quite a bit more of a, just an introduction to the experience. Um, our folks generally don't have any teaching experience in, while they're uh, in their Cambridge classrooms. Yeah, and I think one of the things that we've realized with going to the UK that we 
try to focus on is that um, a lot of people would say, a lot of colleagues have said, why England, you know, that's not, is that that different from the US? And we now would say, absolutely, um, yes, it's quite different. And I think sometimes that surface level um, misunderstanding of the cultural differences in our daily lives is, um, is something that I think um, our colleagues may not recognize. Um, but, but there are other aspects that we think um, because because our students are in a new culture, um, it opens them up to seeing teaching and learning in ways that they wouldn't if there wasn't that cultural dissonance. Um, and so I think what's important about taking our students to England is that, yes, they are immersed in a culture that's quite different from ours, but not so different that they can't leave space for making sense of the professional um, tensions that they experience in the school setting there. And I think that's where we really have such rich conversations um, because they become a part of a community, a culture in England but also a part of a school community and a school culture, which is, um, is I think, super important for their professional development as, uh, as classroom teachers. Um, Christian, do you have anything else to? Yeah, and mostly just to echo, and I, we have not uh, studied the impact of this experience on our teacher candidates' and cultural understandings or their teaching practices, but I think what we've observed over the years of doing this is that this experience in Cambridge is very much a a, a, a gateway experience for them, a gateway drug to international travel and, and cultural experience in, in, a, in a very good way. As we've described it to, um, our, to the teacher candidates and, and to our colleagues as it's abroad, but it's close enough that they can, they think, they feel like they're almost at home, but they know they're not. It's a, it, you know, almost a you know, zone of proximal development when, when it comes to developing cultural understanding. It's also particularly interesting because they're in schools and institutions that they, like all of us, think they know very, very well. They, they understand what school is about until they get to, to England and they don't know what it's about because um, what looks very much the same is actually it, it plays out very differently. Maybe the, the last thing I'll say, and it's just a, it's a fascinating element of being in Northern Virginia, is that our students, you all know, they're Mason students. They're from around the world themselves. They're immigrants themselves. So for them to go abroad to a place again that looks very much like home but isn't is a is a, just a fascinating spin. It's such a, a it's a privilege to be with them with that population of young young people um, in another country. And I would kind of finish by echoing just what everyone has said about the impact on the students in terms of it being just a lifelong kind of shift for them in terms of their personal growth. I think in terms of their professional growth as well, which is really exciting for us to see the connections that they make are incredible. Um, I, have, I have students that will, will say like, it was the first time I tried, you know, different kinds of foods, you know, it's like, like and that, but it was like that the opportunity opened her up to experiences she could have had in the US, but chose not to. She had to be in a different setting to be open um, to, to kind of breaking out of her shell and becoming, I think, um, a bit more independent, which a lot of them um, will share that, that that has happened to them after a travel abroad experience. And it has impacted us as well. I think Christian and I both grow so much personally and professionally um, from leading students on that trip and thinking about teaching and learning with them in that um, in an international context. So um, thanks so much to you, to you all in Global Ed for sure for working with us on developing the trip and hopefully soon um, we'll be crossing the pond. So. <laughs> thanks, Marielle. Thank you. Yes, um, it's, yeah, this is well needed to remind us of, of what we really, what we really are passionate about and why we love it so much. So thank you all. Um, okay, uh, moving on. Uh, Dr. Randy McBride is Associate Professor in the Department of Atmospheric, Oceanic, and Earth Sciences, and he leads one of two of the uh, Mason International Geology Field Camps in the summer, except for last summer, of course. Right, Andy. Right, well, thank you, Marie Alice. And it's nice to be with everybody today and share our differences abroad. Um, and as Marie Alice said that um, I, uh, I'm part of a, a team of uh, faculty and um, you can actually go back to that first slide. And um, so, and I, my field course that we offer is, uh, it's called Geology, Apennine Mountains, uh, Vesuvius and Rome. 
and uh, it's a six week course um, that is uh, that we've been offering now. Let's three. Let's see, three times in 2017, 18, and 19. And uh, a lot of people get they they the the field camp is kind of a um, a term that's very well known in the geological community. And it overall means that it's a, a capstone field geology course for geology and earth science majors where you're um, spending six weeks in the field doing mapping of different rock types and describing rock sections and so forth. And uh, overall, uh, it's an upper level course, which might be a little different from a lot of the other uh, study abroad courses. And so there's seven required geology courses that students have to have successfully completed or other universities around the country before they can actually enroll in this, in this, in our field course. So it's a classic capstone type of course. And we overall uh, fly into Rome and, um, and then we spend about a month in the Apennine Mountains, kind of central um, Italy, about three and a half hours northeast, northeast of Rome. And uh, we do a lot of field mapping in that area. And then uh, once we get done there, we, we travel south to um, Pompeii area, just outside of Naples. And we spend time hiking like Vesuvius, which you can see here on the slide on the upper uh, right-hand corner of the, the different photographs. And we visit Pompeii, we visit Herculaneum, we visit uh, Oplantis, which were all affected by the 79 AD eruption of this that buried those different Roman towns by volcanic ash and pyroclastic flows that came from uh, the volcano and um, that have been subsequently excavated by archeologists and, and so it's an unbelievable experience to the geology majors to, to be able to see um, what actually happened in terms of these towns, how, what type of the geological processes were operating that buried these towns and, um, and be able to see what Roman life was like because it, it became, it was uh, pretty much instantaneously real time in 79 AD. So uh, they're all very uh, critically important archeology span sites. Um, and then after uh, we spend time in the Pompeii Vesuvius area, we end in Rome, we return to Rome and you can see the Colosseum there in the upper left hand corner of the different photos. And um, we look at uh, everything from Roman building stones in terms of what were they using to build the Colosseum? Where were they getting it? Where were they mining it? Um, we also spend time in different catacombs. Uh, once again, a lot of times, uh, which allows us to look at the geology um, of uh, beneath Rome. Uh, and we spend time in different caves around uh, Rome. So uh, a wonderful opportunity to, uh, for geology students to get a, a firsthand look at um, you know different types of uh, geological processes, different settings um, that they're not accustomed to here in the United States. So um, if we go to the next slide then, this is just to give you a, a, a shot then of, uh, this is actually, I'm on top of the rim of Vesuvius and you're looking actually into into the volcano and as I mentioned we we actually hike up to the top of Vesuvius and we we give a lecture on the top at the top of Vesuvius and talk about volcanic processes and 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 you can actually see um, uh, Pompeii Herculaneum is and so you you have this bird's eye view of of where the volcanic deposits you know, spewed from this volcano and then ended up burying these different Roman towns uh, around uh, Vesuvius. 
Uh, and so it ends up being, uh, you know, it's very difficult active volcano um, here in Virginia. And so this gives uh, students an opportunity to get a firsthand look um, at uh, uh, an active volcano and, um, and the geological processes associated with it. So um, what, what are some of the benefits for students then to study abroad? Um, well, of course, to experience another culture, right? Another language, uh, different cuisine, um, currency, just dealing with exchange rates and, you know, between um, uh, the US dollar and, you know, um, just getting oriented to a, a different currency is very important. And then diff a different form uh, of government. Uh, the Italian government tends to fall very often and it's kind of a kind of unstable uh, government in Italy in a lot of ways. And so that uh, gives them exposure to that. Uh, gain a different perspective on American culture, politics and values, especially now um, with uh, the current administration. Uh, you, you hear a, a very different perspective when you're in Europe uh, uh, about uh, the current administration. Uh, exposed to new geological um, settings, uh, new geological processes, rocks that they've never been exposed to wherever they've been going to school. We get a lot of non-Mason students that participate on our, our course, and so um, they don't, uh, they get an opportunity to see a lot of things that are, that are, you know, very different from their, uh, wherever they go to school. And then last, um, and specifically related to our course, our field geology course, um, they, our students experience uh, archaeological and uh, cultural sites where they can observe links among human history, um, also the history of life on earth, uh, and uh, geologic history. Um, so for example, we visit um, the famous uh, Cretaceous tertiary boundary where uh, the meteorite strike that occurred 65 million years ago that killed off the dinosaurs, for example, was discovered. And it's a very famous geological site in uh, Italy. Um, and so students get a, a firsthand look at, um, you know, this rock section that was studied uh, by geologist and uh, one of the most famous papers ever published was, uh, you know, based on the other site that we visit. So, uh, and then as I mentioned, the, uh, the 79 AD eruption of Vesuvius and its impact uh, on Pompeii and Herculaneum and Oplantis. Um, and on top of everything else, uh, Italy is very uh, tectonically active. So there's uh, been occurring in the past and the most recent earthquake was in 2016 uh, which impacted a number of uh, historic and, and modern cities uh, in central uh, Italy. So um, Italy is a fascinating place for um, geological exploration and to take students there um, to kind of provide a capstone experience uh, that has um, really been, uh, we found uh, very constructive and we've gotten a lot of positive uh, responses from the, the different students over the, over the years. So anyway, that's all uh, I wanted to share today. Well, that's wonderful. Um, and of course, Italy is close to my heart because I used to live down in the Naples area and um, I was for a really major earthquake. So it does happen, it's, it's quite something. <laughs> Uh, so our next presenter is Al Puertes, Associate Professor, School of Integrative Studies, and he specializes in facilitation and dialogue, psychosocial trauma healing, conflict resolution, and theology of struggle, anti-human trafficking, and displacement issues. And he leads several different programs. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Marie Alice, and thank you to the Global Education Office for this um, event. 
So I'm very excited to um, share with you um, just the common threads because I'm, I'm the faculty director of three different study abroad programs. So I will just be sharing the common threads that run through these and maybe one unique characteristic of each. Um, if you notice, you know, I have here the Philippines, Rwanda, Cambodia. These are also countries where I have been working for several years because I'm also a field practitioner for 29 years now and very much privileged to be given the opportunity to work in literally all continents around the world with governments working for the UN on short term basis with different international non-government organizations in places that are affected by war, armed conflict and natural disaster. And so because I have learned so much, you know, from the people that I work with and from these local communities that I've been, you know, very much um, privilege to, to be a part of. I also thought of, you know, um, organizing study abroad programs and perhaps bringing students, you know, to these places as my way of, as an expression of gratitude and my way of thanking the people who have helped me, you know, um, in, my, in my professional work, my personal um, undertaking as well. So, in 2008, that's when I um, started the Philippines Study Abroad Program. <laughs> 12 years now, well, except, except for this year. Um, it's a six credit course every summer, focusing on human trafficking um, and community engagement. And then the one in Rwanda just started a couple years ago, focusing on genocide, healing, and reconciliation. I've been working in Rwanda for eight years um, already, and in those, um, in Eastern, Central and Eastern Africa. And then in Cambodia, uh, the program focuses on post-genocide community development and spirituality. So the Rwanda and the Cambodia program, you know, um, I do them alternately. And because this is very much an experiential uh, learning based kind of work um, or courses, I came up with a motto and this motto somehow shapes and influences the nature of the program and all the learning activities that go with it. It says, the country is the classroom. The people we encounter, the local communities we visit, and the activities that we undertake are the living texts. The stories that we hear and the experiences we are privileged to go through embody the message or content of the course. That's why before embarking on a trip, I would always um, make it a point that students that join in any of these three programs, you know, go there for the right purpose. Because otherwise that would be, that would be very, very um, difficult. So the one in, in the Philippines, you know, students are given the opportunity to, to work with children, young people, and women, including men who have been trafficked. You know, and by the way, I might be I might be uttering you know graphic words here, but it's just to bring home you know the message um, of my um, program um, experiences that otherwise they might not have a chance to experience here unless you are a licensed therapist or licensed counselor, licensed psychologist. But what usually happens when we go to the Philippines is we well I'm from the Philippines myself, and so I I develop the program myself in coordination with the different faith-based organization, environmental-based organization, human rights, social-based organizations, academic-based organizations, you know, um, but then students are given the opportunity to work directly with, with um, victims and survivors of um, human trafficking, particularly sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And they also have the opportunity to um, do home stays and so this gives them that direct firsthand experience to really experience what life is like, you know, being a part of a Filipino household. And then um, we also visit and learn from fair trade um, women's organizations, you know, because that is basically one response to address the exacerbation of human trafficking. How do we establish communities that are fair trade? You know, business establishments that are based on fair wage and you know making sure that the workers and the producers are being taken care of 
The um, study abroad in Rwanda um, gives us the opportunity to work directly firsthand with people who have experienced forgiveness and reconciliation. That's why Rwanda is actually a model country in the world today, you know, in terms of how the entire country has gone through this healing by way of forgiveness and reconciliation. It is mind boggling for students to really meet, dance, hang out and learn, you know, and spend days all over the country with people who have been perpetrators and victims slash survivors during the 1994 um, mass genocide. But of course, even the year 1994, there were already skirmishes and glimpses of um, killings in, in, in the country. But for, for the participants in the Rwanda Study Abroad Program to really, you know, kind of learn firsthand from people who have gone through so much and yet made a conscious decision to really bring about healing by way of forgiveness and reconciliation is extremely transformative for many of them. And then Cambodia is another country that also experiences mass genocide under the Khmer Rouge regime, you know, under Pol Pot from 1975 to 1979. And so students also had a chance to visit mass graves and then meet people who have also survived, you know, um, during that time and learn from them about resilience and what keeps them going, what sustains them. You know, so community, it's very, very much community, you know, engaged uh, based program. And um, participants have the chance to learn various societal events but more so establish relationship with the people. I always emphasize and remind students, you know, before embarking on a trip, that we are going to this country to learn and learn and learn, not to, not to teach, not to quote unquote help, because it just kind of, you know, um, perpetuates this colonialist mentality that, oh, here, here comes this American students, you know, coming to our country and then doing something for us. You know, I want our students to learn first and foremost, from these local communities and then in the process, in the process, share and then have some meaningful conversations and dialogues for the sake of learning and enriching each other. And then, um, of course, you know, learning about human trafficking, the aftermath of genocide, but at the same time, particularly in Cambodia, you know, very much a Buddhist country. So students have the chance, we work, we spend several days working with Buddhist monks, monks who are engaged, you know, um, very much immersed in their society and daily affairs of the world, learning about applied spirituality, you know, about healing and also reconciliation. So when students participate in this program, I also gave them the opportunity to do internship. I mean, um, independent study. You know, um, for example, someone still needs to, to uh, register the course for an extra credit, you know, towards completion of his or her degree. I gave students the opportunity to do that. And so part of my responsibility, and this is also to entice them to join <laughs> and participate in the program, is really to, you know, um, establish rapport and relationship with local organizations whom they uh, want organizations that they want to, to partner with. And then um, students also, many students, by the way, um, also extend their stay after the program is over. You know, either to do vol uh, volunteer service or do internship. And then the essence of all these three study abroad programs is really establishing relationships and connections with local communities, with the people whom we meet. And so many of them, you know, several months later, a year later, decide to return to this country on their own, you know, because by then they have already established, you know, um, connections and um, relationships. Some of them decide to return to the country, either the Philippines, Rwanda, or Cambodia to do internship. And so I continue my commitment to them, you know, by, by, um, in, by introducing them to organizations that they wish to, um, to be a part of. So the three major um, points that I would like to highlight here, you know, is that in a world that is becoming a global village, I think students really need, you know, to remind themselves of the importance uh, of expanding their horizons 
and discover what the universe has to offer. And someone, I think a couple of the previous um, presenters mentioned about the importance of getting outside of the comfort zone and realize that there's so much to learn actually out there. Discovering the richness of what different cultures and people in different parts of the world can teach us about life, history, current events, resilience, people's hope and aspirations is to me what experiential learning is about. And the beauty about this is that when students return, it's something that they would always bring with them wherever they go. Um, and then the second point is that experiential learning through study abroad helps expand and enrich their competencies. Competencies in global understanding, critical and reflective thinking, you know, especially um, in my Philippine study abroad program, realizing that students actually bring with them all their personal unresolved issues. And so whenever they are confronted with extreme poverty, which is a push factor that makes children and young people become vulnerable and prone to human trafficking, you know, this is when they also try to make sense of what issues, personal issues, family issues, students may bring with them. And so this actually becomes a moment for them to also do introspection and then um, realizing further, you know, um, who they are once they are in this country. One, one student in the past said, going to the Philippines, I found my home. And that particular quote was, was extremely um, moving um, to me. And then they also expand their civic engagement competency, problem solving, because they go to these places that have experienced so much, you know, and then learn how people really try to solve and make sense of what has happened to them in the aftermath of genocide of these human trafficking and um, what have you. And then of course, um, aesthetic awareness, finding the silver lining, you know, how are people sustaining themselves, keeping themselves, you know, keep, what keeps them going, you know? And of course, communication as well, um, oral and written, at the same time, interpersonal relationship and mindfulness competencies. And then the third um, and final point is that this is an excellent way to start and establish their international social network through NGOs and local government units that we partner and work with. So for as long as I'm able, for as long as there is this global education office at Mason, I will continue, you know, um, bringing students over to these countries. Because it's also, um, it has enriched me. This is where I also find strength and inspiration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marialis. Thank you, thank you, Al. Yes, um, I have gone and seen a couple of the presentations that the groups of students have done afterwards, and th those students are just are, are deeply moved by the things that they learn while they're abroad. Hi, my name is Andrew Novak in the Criminology Department. I take students to The Hague, Brussels, and Nuremberg to talk about war crimes trials and European integration. I think that this really has impacted how I teach and my own research. Uh, in particular, I teach uh, international criminal justice and human rights, and I've included a European integration unit in both of those classes. Plus, my own research is about uh, how legal and constitutional norms spread and about sharing of legal norms uh, between countries. And the European Union gives me a lot to think about, both about convergence among legal systems and about harmonization uh, through legal institutions and that kind of thing. So I have really enjoyed going behind the scenes at international criminal tribunals and at EU institutions. And I think that I am enriched and the students in my classes are also enriched. Hi, I'm Jim Lepore. I teach in Mason School of Dance and I lead groups of students to Cuba to study Afro-Cuban dance. The heterogeneous nature of Afro-Cuban culture is unlike anything we in the U.S. are accustomed to. There is a Yoruba Cuban culture, a Congo Cuban culture, a Dahomean Cuban culture, a Calabar Cuban culture, that's the people from present day Cameroon, and a Haitian Cuban culture. What's striking about these cultures in Cuba is that they're all vital with scores of multi-generational practitioners and participants. And I was astonished when I first went at how animated 
and energized and fun they were. They were also inclusive. All were accessible even for an older foreign white male. I hadn't imagined that. And when I began to design study abroad programs, those were the experiences I wanted my students to be immersed in. There's also a level of support for the arts that I hadn't expected. An immediate illustration of this always greets my students when we arrive at the rundown theater with barely functioning vintage bathrooms that is the home to Conjunto Folklorico Cutumba, from whom we take dance classes in Santiago. Cutumba is charged with maintaining and performing the folkloric African diasporic traditions of Cuba. The company has 50 salaried members. This includes 25 dancers, 20 musicians, and five technicians. And it's one of dozens of companies in Cuba with a similar charge. There's nothing on par with this in the US. We have large dance companies in metropolitan areas that are primarily ballet, but Cuba also has that. However, companies like Kutumba, dedicated to preserving the cultural traditions of the underclass, we don't have. Part of the reason that these companies like Kutumba exist in Cuba is because they reflect a political socialist perspective that elevates the aesthetics and traditions of the working class. But they're also a reflection of a phenomenon that's unique in the, the Americas. At a time when the persecution of African traditions in Cuba was commonplace in the 1920s and 30s, a number of influential scholars and academics led by anthropologist Fernando Ortiz began to, erect, to recognize the depth, the richness, and the aesthetic value of extent African culture in Cuba. This vanguard of academics began to uh, public movements to explicitly recognize and preserve Afro-Cuban traditions. Traditions that at the time to avoid persecution were typically practiced out of the public eye. The, cl the closest parallel we have to something like this in the US is the Mardi Gras Indians in New Orleans, who really only in the past decade and primarily for purposes of promoting tourism have begun to gain appropriate recognition as guardians of our own diasporic roots, as antecedents of American traditions as significant as jazz and rock and roll. In Santiago, our daily classes with Katumba typically begin with a short historical overview of the specific genre of dance we're gonna learn and perform that day. A short song class, since these dance forms would not have been preserved without the music and songs that are intertwined with them. And the song classes are often in uh, a surviving African language. And then the dance class to live music for an hour and a half, typically accompanied by four or more musicians. Evenings are dedicated to pursuing live music, which is easy to find and integrating ourselves into the dance scene that's common in those venues since popular music in Cuba, for the most part, is music to move to. A lot of what we learn during the day is put into practice in real time in the evenings with Cubans, more often than not, as our dance partners. You've probably concluded by now from this description that diversity, inclusion, and social justice are central themes woven into the study abroad course called Cuban Dance and Culture. In Cuba, though, these themes aren't only cognitive, they are sensate felt experiences. Our, Cubans, our Cuban teachers often pause to let us know that for many Cubans, dancing has always been a way of remembering a way of honoring ancestors, and even a way of bringing ancestors back to life. So this practice of dancing to live music in the intense sensory state required to be present in the moment is also a way to celebrate the extraordinary things that ordinary people did overcoming daunting obstacles to retain and pass on a culture they were proud of. Do our students take all of this in? Not quite all of it, but luckily, they have to put down their phones for most of the day because internet is not nearly as ubiquitous there as it is here. 
So in fact, a lot of it thankfully does get in. And more often than not, they come home viewing their world through a lens informed by important artifacts that we as US Americans are still struggling to weave into our own narrative as was evident in our political climate this spring and summer. Thank you. We're walking and someone yells out, I love you, D. Wright. This has been the best experience of my life. And it's only day three. I love hearing that, but it's more than the self-gratification that leads me to be such a strong proponent for study abroad opportunities. I've led study abroad trips since 2008, and since then I've introduced almost 200 students to Italy's very rich and storied media, culture, and society, and my program has become a part of who I am. Over this time, I've also been an academic advisor who has encouraged students to study abroad, and you might wonder why or how. Today, I'll explain four reasons why a student should study abroad college credit, their resume, immersion, and learning. The first reason is pretty simple. Students need to take classes to graduate, and a study abroad can be a great way to do so, especially during winter or summer break. Sometimes a student is taking a difficult or challenging set of courses during a spring or fall semester, and they don't take a full load, leaving them short credits. Other times, students want to graduate early and earning credits during a break is a convenient way to do that. Regardless of why, the fact remains that doing a study abroad trip is an exciting way to earn college credits needed for graduation. A second reason a student might want to attend a study abroad program is to have a line to add on their resume. A 2018 article by Tamilla and Ledgerwood found that organizations are expecting new hires to be culturally aware and prepared to work in a global economy. And they further stated that study abroad trips provide students the soft skills such as cultural awareness that organizations want. My third point is that college is great for classroom knowledge, certainly. But there is also the opportunity for self-growth through immersion, where a student can physically experience things on a study abroad. Learning about a new community is terrific reason to study abroad. According to the 2021 U.S. News and World Report Best Colleges list, Mason ranks 15th in the nation for ethnic diversity. However, there are still many students who have never lived outside of the United States or even traveled far from the greater DC area. For this population, studying abroad can be a great way to broaden their experiences. A richly diverse student population can make in-class discussions robust. However, nothing can compare to the opportunity to immerse oneself into a culture through study abroad. My last point is that sometimes students need specific credits to graduate. Maybe they're learning a language and a study abroad is a great way to learn and improve those skills. Perhaps their major offers a study abroad where they can earn credits for their major or their concentration. Or perhaps they have some elective credits to use and they want to enrich their education with a study abroad. Regardless of why, Earning credits is definitely one great reason to study abroad. To be sure, not every student who has gone on a study abroad with me has gotten the most out of it. But in my experience, that rests 100% on that particular student. A goal-oriented student understands what a privilege it is to study in a foreign country and knows that immersing him or herself in the experience makes a difference. They know it will help them with future job searches, and they appreciate how they can earn college credit. They are the best candidates for a study abroad program. While there will be other best days ever in their future, their lives will be forever changed when they study abroad in ways faculty directors and advisors will never know. Hi, this is Trevor Thrall. Uh, from the Schar School of Policy and Government, and I lead the International Security Studies in Switzerland course 
It's a six credit course that takes place in July, hopefully every summer other than last summer to Fribourg, Switzerland, a small college town not far from Geneva. Uh, I love this course for a lot of reasons. Um, it is jam packed with all sorts of stuff uh, for students. Uh, we start with a few weeks of online preparation and lecture discussion and papers uh, while back here in the States. And then we go to Freiburg uh, over the three weeks, the students have sessions afternoon and evening. Um, and the array of people that they are exposed to is just phenomenal. Uh, human rights lawyers, professors from the University of Freiburg, ministers from the Swiss uh, foreign ministry, uh, NATO officials, ambassadors, our um, host is um, a Ukrainian um, by sort of nationality originally and has <coughs> connections throughout the Ukrainian government. So we have met several Ukrainian foreign ministers and ambassadors over the last few years. It's been very exciting. Um, Swiss military officials, human rights lawyers, um, the, uh, the president of the Swiss chapter of uh, ICRC uh, last <coughs> year uh, spoke at our July 4th party. It was really a very intimate, very cool setting. Um, we also take site visits. We get on a big uh, double-decker Mercedes bus, go to the United Nations in Geneva, Council of Europe in Strasbourg. We go to NATO in Brussels and the EU parliament there as well. Um, we also get to have a fondue dinner deep underground inside a Swiss mountain fortress. Pretty hard to beat. I mean, three weeks of wine, cheese, chocolate, and travel are hard to beat regardless. Uh, but when you're getting a world-class education at the same time, it's, I think, an, an incredible experience for students. Uh, and as a person who um, traveled abroad during college myself, um, you know, I see in my students the same sorts of things that I valued from my own time abroad in college. And so I, I thought I would just focus my remarks on the three reasons I think Mason students uh, have to study abroad um, more, more than ever. And these are the same things I pitched the students. So if I sound <coughs> like I'm marketing, I sort of am. Um, and the first is that I tell them they're going to get an invaluable global perspective. And what I mean by that is, you know, simply that, you know, through no fault of their own, most of the professors that our students encounter at George Mason are in fact American. And, you know, Americans are, are awesome, go America and all that, but, you know, Americans see things from a certain point of view, certain perspective. It's not the wrong perspective um, or not always, but it's only one perspective. And when they go to Europe in particular, um, <laughs> and we talk about security issues in particular, uh, students are exposed to a wildly different way of looking at things, not only at how the United States is behaving, but how uh, the international community works, how it should work, uh, all sorts of things, even things that are silly that you didn't think there was a different way to do things. Of course, when you go abroad, you learn, wow, there are very different ways of doing things. And so students, especially who come from uh, you know, an America that is no longer uh, very good at, at talking <coughs> about um, in the news, uh, the rest of the world, um, you know, it's a really important way for students to broaden their perspective and come back a, a better global citizen. The second big reason I think students more than ever need to study abroad is to prepare for careers that have international uh, scope and scale. Uh, and so many careers these days, increasing, I think, number of careers these days have that kind of scope and scale that I think uh, having time abroad is critical for our students um, to burnish their resumes, to get their feet under them um, for careers that are gonna require them to understand the rest of the world. And I'm happy to say that a number of the alums from this program are now um, doing internships, doing jobs at the UN and other international organizations. So, um, you know, for, for our students who want international careers, getting abroad, getting a taste of these organizations that they might want to work with someday, um, is just a fantastic way to get them going down that path. And then the last reason is that, you know, quite simply, it's a life-changing experience. Um, you can't, you can't go abroad and come back the same person you started, I dare you. Um, and you know, what else is college for but to um, become the person that you want to be. So uh, for all these reasons, I think Mason students now more than ever need to think about studying abroad. And I really encourage faculty who have been on the fence about this thinking, oh, I don't know, you know, it's, it's an amazing experience to watch students go through. Thanks a lot.
Lauren, would you like to uh, do your thing now too? Um, Lauren uh, brings, uh, has gone to Ke uh, Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya, along with Dr. Lisa Billingham. Um, they are both in the um, CVPA, was that School of Performing and Visual Arts, Visual and Performing Arts? College of Visual and Performing Arts. You nearly had it. How long have you worked at uh, me? <laughs> okay. Oh, oh, just yesterday. Just yesterday I started. <laughs> Well, go ahead. Tell us about your program. So, we needed a little Swahili to spice up our afternoon. My little background here is the 21 people that went with me to Kenya in the spring of 2019 as part of an embedded program, which means we went during spring break as a part of the university corral. I am also on that bus where sadly I was supposed to take a group of people to Ireland last summer. So my students are still very sad, but we've decided we're going to do an alumni trip at some point. So I'm going to share a couple of things and then I would like Lauren to add to it and then I'll wrap it up and we'll move on to our next person. So I was fortunate to meet Leonard Wickesa from Nairobi, Kenya at a choral conference in the US. I passed him my business card, he did the same. And seven months later, we were singing in his all girls high school in Kenya. He was literally teaching in a high school that had been a hospital. So his classroom, was probably as a little bit bigger than my office at Mason. So they usually rehearse out of doors. So we went to his high school. We worked at a, a local university and sang with choirs there. We were also fortunate that song that I sang for you, Joy Harper, who is now in a graduate program in music in composition. She actually worked on that arrange, an arrangement of that tune that I just sang for you and our choir learned it here, and the choirs in Africa had prepared it as well, so we sang it together. So we, we built an arrangement on their music. So that commission was an exciting part of our trip. I will tell you, hearing the hippos when you lay in your tent at night, there's nothing in the world like it, and the air in Africa is just absolute the purest I've ever seen. So I'm gonna pass it over to Lauren, and then I'll wrap it up. Take it away, Lauren. So uh, yeah, I, I think the, the greatest part about this afternoon is that we are all clearly former study abroad students ourselves, right? And part of the reason we so eagerly wanted to do a program is so that we had an excuse to do it as part of our jobs. Uh, so uh, that, that part has been amazing and, and getting to go to Africa with Lisa was of course a bucket list item for me, but the greatest, part of it, I think, for me was that we went with a task. So I wasn't, we weren't just visitors, much as you all have done with your courses. We went with an actual thing to accomplish. And, and we, were a mem we were a choir, and we were going to have a series of performances with choirs in Africa. So our students got to have, you know, a, a, an outcome to work toward that it just so happened that we would be doing it in a different location. But the beauty of that was our college students got to work with a wide range of Kenyan students, all kinds of ages, um, community members to middle school girls. Um, they got to feel what it was like to share something immediately, right? So we were blessed as well. Others have talked about being able to have English as the language, so that barrier wasn't there. So we did get to have that. But they also had the fact that they were all singers. They know what an alto is and they know what a tenor is and where you should stand in the choir. But then they got to learn all kinds of different things like how is music taught in Africa? How is music taught in Kenya versus the way it has been taught in this country? It was, for me, it was, it was wonderful to get to sort of snoop on this, uh, like to watch this uh, course unfold and to watch the students do a different kind of learning, which we've all talked about. You learn it a different way when you're uncomfortable, right? And, uh, and put out of your comfort zone. Um, but the other thing I, I want to say is that I, the, the choir was a wonderful metaphor, I think, for uh, how we want our students to engage 
um, with students and other community members of other countries and other cultures uh, is that we, we are all, we can all sing. We may not all think we sing well, but we can all sing. And so when we have the opportunity to work on something together, our choir of 21 became in many cases a choir of 81 based on the number of students who would stand and sing with us. Um, I also think it was a wonderful opportunity to go to Kenya in particular um, for many reasons, but the Kenyans all came up and asked about, and I, I, I don't mean to bring politics into this, but since our former president had been Kenyan himself, a lot of the Kenyans wanted to talk about when would we have another Kenyan president in the United States again. And so it, it reminded me that it's not just a learning opportunity for our students being ambassadors of the United States, but for the Kenyan students to get to understand that the United States is more nuanced than who might be sitting in the Oval Office at the moment. And I'll say it was wonderful having Lauren along when we had had a, a previous PhD student who's a public school teacher and I said, you need to come along and take it for credit and she's teaching the music in her own classrooms in Fairfax County. But for me, the most beautiful thing is that because the world is virtual now, I have been able to go to Ken Wakia's rehearsal in Kenya, and we are working on ways for our students to do things virtually. And I'm long-term process working on a documentary of our trip. And then we're hoping to bring some of the students the, the college students that may even be out of school by the time we get to do this, to bring them here to do a, a, a reverse invitation. So I wanna thank you very much for the opportunity to present, but I really want to thank the Global Office. I have to give Allie, Allie Wallace a shout out, woo woo, because she is the most <laughs> phenomenal planner on earth. She helped to make it affordable. And I hope that there's going to be a day again soon where Lauren and I have vowed we're going back again. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak today. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. And actually that is, that's it. Um, we do have a, a few um, other folks who, who sent things into our office um, to, to show, but um, be, in the interest of time, because we've gone over time, uh, and I know that everybody has very busy lives, that I will just make those available to everyone. I've put in the chat that um, we have a, um, sorry, I put in the chat, uh, there's a response form if you would like to uh, click into that and just um, leave your thoughts. Um, or you can email me directly and uh, ask me any question you want. Uh, if you want to get in touch with others who were who uh, presented today, I'd be happy to make connections for you all. And um, yeah, I think that's about it. Well, thank you all so much for coming. I'll hang on um, in case anybody has any questions uh, for me. And uh, otherwise, I hope that we will shortly be sending people out uh, into the world again. Thank you very much and have a wonderful uh, weekend and a great holiday. Thank you to Gio. You're welcome.